Good, good afternoon. My name is Philip Munoz, and it's my privilege to direct uh, our constitutional studies program and the Tocqueville program. My pr privilege to welcome uh, you here this afternoon. A wonderful event. I want to thank ND Votes uh, for their support. ND Votes, as you might, uh, my, my guess, is a student group here uh, that's uh, working to increase civic literacy and uh, get out the vote for Notre Dame students. So voting has begun. Uh, and so make sure you get out there and uh, do your duty uh, and vote, um, whether here in Indiana or uh, in your own locality. Uh, a couple of announcements. We have uh, one more event this semester. And that is uh, uh, November 27th. Uh, very excited about this. Uh, William Galston, Bill Galston, um, has a column in the Wall Street Journal and uh, is at the Brookings Institution. And it's probably best known as uh, he was one of Bill Clinton's senior advisors. So Bill Galston, that's going to be on November 27th, uh, I believe in this room at this time. And uh, he's going to be speaking on liberalism after Trump. Okay. So I hope you join us for that. That'll be our final event of, of the semester. Uh, fantastic event today. Very pleased uh, to have our uh, two visitors. I'm going to have uh, Noel Johnson, a, a Tocqueville fellow, uh, physics and theology and philosophy uh, student, come introduce our speakers. And um, before she does so, just one short announcement. We have our newest Tocqueville fellow, uh, 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 Ramesh Panuru, <laughs> as uh, a nine-week-old Xavier. So congratulations. To, um, I am pleased to introduce Damon Linker and Ramesh Panuru, our speakers for today's conversation, A Blue Wave, the 2018 midterm elections and the future of American democracy. Speaking first is Damon Linker, a graduate of Ithaca College. He received his master's in history from NYU and a PhD in political science from Michigan State University. A New York City native, he now resides in the suburbs of Philadelphia with his wife and two children. He is currently a senior correspondent at theweek.com and a consulting editor at the University of Pennsylvania Press. He has edited for The New Republic, Newsweek, and First Things, and has even served as a speechwriter for New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. His books include The Theocons, Secular America Under Siege, and The Religious Test, why we must question, question the beliefs of our leaders. Speaking second is Ramesh Panuru, a graduate of Princeton University who grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, and now resides in the DC area with his wife and three children. Currently a senior editor at National Review and a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. He is also a columnist for Bloomberg View, a contributing editor to National Affairs, a visiting fellow at the American Ent Enterprise Institute and a contributor to CBS News. He is, quote, a regular speaker on policy, politics, and constitutionalism at the nation's leading college campuses and law schools. So, of course, he's here at Notre Dame. <laughs> and is the author of The Party of Death, The Democrats, the Media, the Courts, and the Disregard for Human Life, and also The Mystery of Japanese Growth. Both of our speakers have been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and many other major publications. And based on their intelligent and provocative insights, today's conversation is sure to be impressive. Please join me in welcoming Damon Linker and Ramesh Panuru. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, thanks to Professor Munoz uh, and to uh, the Constitutional Studies Program for the invitation to be here today. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, as I understand it, uh, I have two tasks before me today in uh, what will be certainly no more than 15 minutes, I promise. Here, I'm taking out my phone, so I have a timer right there. Um, the first one is what I think will happen in the midterm elections a week from today. And second, what should my side be doing? 
uh, and my side for the purposes of this uh, discussion is the Democratic side, although the, the truth is that I'm far more of an anti-Republican than a pro-Democrat. Um, but in our politics, that kind of thing isn't that unusual. That's called negative partisanship, and it's quite uh, rampant. And in that sense, I'm very much a man of my time. Um, so the first question, what will happen? That's, I think, actually a little bit the less interesting question, uh, because it requires that I act like a fortune teller with a crystal ball. And there's probably far too much of that already in political punditry. Um, the kind of the, the best example, the high water mark uh, gold standard of this is Nate Silver and the folks he's gathered around him at 538, the website where they do aggregate poll analysis and kind of game all of this out in horse race fashion. Uh, and I'd like to note kind of parenthetically that there's something uh, a little deceptive about the entire attempt to kind of come up with probabilistic assumptions about what's going to happen in the future based on polling data. For instance, before the 2016 election, 538 gave Hillary Clinton, this is on the morning of the election in, in uh, 2016, gave Hillary Clinton a 71% chance of winning and obviously Donald Trump less than that. And yet, Trump, of course, won. Now, at the same time, other polling analysis outfits, like the one at Huffington Post, gave Hillary Clinton a 98% chance of winning. So when Trump, in fact, won, was that actually the equivalent of having two silver coins and one gold coin in your pocket and pulling out the gold coin? Or was it like having? 98 silver coins in your pocket, two gold coins, and pulling out a gold coin. That's really what that ends up being about, is the event that actually happened, was it, like, was it a, hmm, that's kind of surprising, or was it like, holy cow, I can't believe this happened. This is a black swan event. It's unbelievable. That's really all that all this kind of gaming out of stuff is really about. It's an attempt to pretend that we can know what we don't know with greater certainty than we ever can. So again, I, I, I will leave it that kind of sneering criticism aside now, move beyond epistemology and actually just tell you that I, in all of my infinite wisdom as an expert, having read things like the 538 analysis, will say that I believe in the conventional wisdom. Probably the Democrats are going to are going to uh, win the House by some indeterminate margin, and they will not win the Senate. The Republicans will keep control of the Senate. That's what the fundamentals would lead us to expect in many instances. Uh, the fundamentals are what political scientists talk about are kind of the structural background assumptions of any event. So. What we tend to see in the modern era is that when you have the party held, uh, the, the presidency and Congress are held by a party in a midterm election, they tend to lose seats. So this happened in 1994 when control of the House moved for the first time in 40 years from the Democrats to the Republicans, in 2006 when it moved from the Republicans to the Democrats, and again in 2010 when it swung from the Democrats to the Republicans in the House. Now, this looks likely to happen again in 2018, this time from the Republicans to the Democrats. And in this case, we have the added uh, kind of oomph to the data because of the uh, great unpopularity of our current president. Trump has been, as they say, underwater with his rate of disapproval beating his rate of approval by more than 10 percentage points since a mere two weeks after his inauguration. That's true even now when actually he's as popular as he's ever been as president. Uh, he, he just last week on the 538 aggregate just scraped 43% approval, which is the highest he's been since late March in 2017. Since then, it's all been down. So in the scheme of his presidency, Trump is at a high water mark, and yet he's still 10 points underwater when you actually include the disapproval rating. So a second consideration. Every poll of the generic ballot that I've seen, which just asks usually a, an open-ended question like, are you more likely to vote for a nameless Democrat or a Republican in the upcoming election, has shown the Democrats in the lead. 
sometimes by margins of seven, eight, nine, ten, or more points. If you look at the graphs of these, it's, it's consistent. Blue for Democrat up here, red for Republican down here. They get closer, they move apart, but it's always with Democrats in the lead. So one would expect that the Democrats would do well. As for the Senate, that was always going to be tough for the Democrats in this cycle, uh, just because of which seats are open, which of the third seats in the Senate are up this cycle. So I, and everyone seems to agree that, you know, the odds are with the Republicans to hold the chamber. So I, I guess on this part of my remarks, I'd like to close by noting a couple of uncertainties to keep in mind. One is turnout. Polling is often based on likely voters, the people who the pollster assumes are going to show up. But what if those assumptions are wrong? We never really know that until the election has taken <clears throat> place. So if we get unusually high turnout on the Democratic side, which people are thinking we might see, uh, that would lead to one outcome. But what if actually the Republicans, because of all of the controversy around Brett Kavanaugh's nomination, now combined with fear of the caravan marching here, 7,000 unarmed uh, people from mostly from Honduras heading toward the border, uh, and President Trump is doing everything he can to keep that in the news. He's sending now, it sounds like, 14,000 troops, which is two troops for every one migrant to the southern border to protect us from the threat posed here. What if that really gets Republicans to show up way more than you'd expect? Normally, the fundamentals would tell us to expect in this kind of a situation that the party, again, of the, of the president, people tend to be pretty complacent. Like, eh, he's the president. We have the presidency for the next two years. I'm not going to bother to vote. But what if Republicans are extra energized this time because of these issues? That would also uh, tend to make things a little bit unpredictable. Um, the second uncertainty is the issue of gerrymandering of districts combined with the urban clustering of Democrats. This is the issue that Democrats tend to live in cities, and so what you end up with often are vote totals where you have a lot of what what analysts call wasted votes. In other words, uh, you know, the clearest example of a wasted vote would be like the whole California vote in the 2016 election, where Hillary Clinton won all of the electoral votes in California the moment she won 50% plus one. But she ended up winning 66, 67% of the votes in California. All of those votes between 50% plus one and what she got were wasted votes because they weren't needed to get her any electoral votes. This tends to happen at a kind of micro level at the level of cities because Democrats tend to live very, very, uh, tend to live in higher density areas than Republicans, which means that you end up with overwhelmingly Democratic districts and cities. You put that together with the, the act of Republican legislatures drawing districts in order to increase this tendency of wasted votes on the other side and efficient votes on their other on their own side and you end up with a situation like in 2012 where if you added up all the votes cast in all the house races in the country democrats won 1.5 million more votes than republicans and yet the margin ended up being that republicans had the house majority uh, by 234 to 201. So a lot of people have been concerned on the Democratic side that this year the combination of the urban clustering getting even more intense combined with even more gerrymandering than ever could end up with a situation in which if you add up all the votes after election day next week you learn that actually the uh, Democrats end up winning by three, four, five, six, seven points percentage points over Republicans in the total votes. But when they're distributed across all those 435 districts, it turns out that actually the Republicans hold the chamber. If that happens, things could get pretty ugly, exactly how and how that'll work out and what that ug ugliness looks not like, perhaps we can talk about in the, in the uh, discussion part uh, of this event. So. Um, so finally, what do I think Dem Democrats should be doing, the second part of, of the agenda? Well, I would say pretty much exactly what they have been doing, which could be described as a strategy of divide and conquer. 
use the diversity of the party, the fact that it has some very, very liberal or left-leaning candidates and voters, uh, and then also some much more conservative voters and candidates in different parts of the country, use that diversity to the party's advantage. So you run a social democrat in a very, very liberal district in New York City, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, run someone like that there and she'll clean up and do well. But then in more conservative areas, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, Texas, in the Midwest, run more cu especially culturally moderate candidates who also run on a kind of economically populist message. That is an effective strategy for the Democrats to do quite well, and I think they've been doing pretty well at it so far. But this strength, keep this in mind, will become a weakness as we head into the 2020 presidential race, when the party will need to choose a single standard bearer, leaving one of these factions deeply alienated. With most of the activist energy in the party coming from the left, it's likely that someone in the ideological vicinity of Bernie Sanders is going to end up as the party's nominee in two years. Will that be a more formidable alternative to Trump than Hillary Clinton was? Appealing to some of Trump's more economically populist supporters? Or will it instead antagonize moderate Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents, weakening the nominee in the general election in part by opening him or her to attacks from the right as an extremist and a socialist. On the other hand, if a more moderate candidate becomes the nominee, which I doubt, but if that happened, how will the highly motivated left wing of the Democratic Party respond? Will the voters stay home or back a potent third party challenge from the left, quite likely ensuring that Trump wins re-election? Call it a blessing or a curse, but we certainly do live in politically interesting times. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Tocqueville um, program for bringing me here. Um, thank you, Noel, for that introduction. I'm always um, delighted when somebody gets my name right uh, at, a, at a public event, uh, having I was once called Deepak Chopra on national television. <laughs> um, and, um, and thank you for the, uh, for the onesie, uh, although it's a little, uh, a little dismaying to see that uh, Xavier's already outstripping me academically at, uh, at nine weeks. But, uh, you know, the nice thing about the name Xavier is uh, nobody thinks he's a Presbyterian baby. He's a, you know, we, got that, we got that base covered. Um, so... Like Damon, I, I want to spend a little less time on the sophology question. Um, as I, I've been, I've always been reluctant to offer election predictions, and I became more so after my uh, my mid 2015 prediction that surely the Republican Party would never be so reckless as to nominate Donald Trump for president. Uh, a prediction that is maybe not looking that great right now. Um, I do think you know, that. Uh, We've still got undecided voters out there. About, about 14, 15% of independents seem to be undecided. Historically, they break one way or the other. They're not going to split 50-50 um, when they actually vote. And, uh, and that is the difference between there being a w democratic wave and, and there not being one. Um, that said, uh, if I had to predict, I would, I would think the House Democrats pick up about 30 seats uh, end up with a slim but not catastrophically slim majority, something like 225 uh, House Democrats to 210 um, House Republicans. Uh, and I guess at that point, uh, Pelosi would have to twist some arms um, to get people to pretend on the Democratic side that they hadn't said that they weren't going to vote for her for Speaker. Uh, and uh, that she, she's actually pretty good at that, and she'll, she'll probably make it, and she'll be um, Speaker again. Uh, in the Senate, I would expect Republicans to pick up a, a seat, you know, maybe end up with like 53 um, Republican senators. And, and as Damon said, I think that's almost entirely a function of the map. By some measures, this is the best map that Republicans have had since the popular election of senators began uh, in the 19, in what, 1918 would have been the first uh, one of those. Um, and uh, it's, you know, one, if, 
if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, I mean, you know, 40,000 votes in three states had gone the other way, uh, I imagine Republicans would be close to getting filibuster um, proof in the Senate. Um, the, I mean, I suppose the, another way of looking at the map is that um, Democrats had very good Senate elections in 2000, in 2006, and in 2012. Uh, same class of, of seats, and it's just hard to keep that streak going uh, at this point. The last time they had a bad uh, election with this group of seats was 1994. Uh, and so they're, they're about due, but having the White House in Republican hands is, is sort of muting that effect. So I thought, um, having having done that, I would uh, I would talk a little bit about the sort of the state of our party politics, um, as Damon suggested. I do think negative polarization is sort of the key feature of American politics right now. We've somebody has said I forget I don't know who uh, has said that uh, our uh, politics today is characterized by weak parties and strong partisanship. Um, they're weak parties in the sense that the party organizations can't do what they used to be able to do. They can't, for example, deprive the people that they heartily dislike of uh, the nomination for various seats. Um, but, uh, but there's the strong negative polarization where each side is united more by its dislike of the other side um, than it is by any philosophical principle or policy objective that it holds in common. The other thing that strikes me about the about this moment in our politics is that both party coalitions are are convinced that they <laughs> represent a silent majority of the public already, um, and you see that with um, President Trump's rhetoric all the time, where he, even though of course he didn't get a plurality of the popular vote, he describes himself as kind of the embodiment of the popular will, and his opponents are not just his opponents; they're the enemies of the people. I mean, I think that was part of the, the, the impulse behind the, the inaugural weekend boasting about you know, record numbers of uh, imaginary people showing up to, uh, to watch Trump take office. Um, but at the same time, I think you have something similar on uh, the Democratic side, where they think sort of we already um, represent the popular will. And I think there's a kind of a misreading of the popular vote victory in 2016, where people forget that um, you know, a lot of the votes for Hillary Clinton were actually votes against Donald Trump. Uh, it's not that a majority of the public is in love with either of these party coalitions. So what happens when each party believes it already represents the public? Well, two things. One, neither side actually believes that it needs to persuade people who aren't already in the, their camps, right? Um, you've already got the people. All you've got to do is mobilize them, turn them out. Second, if you lose, there must be some nefarious explanation since you represent the people. And you've got sort of competing nefarious explanations on each side. On the Republican side, it's you know the, the deep state is undermining you, or the news media, or Hollywood. Those things are, are keeping people from seeing um, that they're actually with Trump, and they're with the Republicans. On the Democratic side, it's dark money. Um, it's gerrymandering. Uh, now, these, in both cases, actually, there is something to each of these explanations. Um, the urban clustering and gerrymandering do create a structural disadvantage for Democrats in the House and the Senate. On the other hand, there also, there's also, are also disadvantages that historically they have been able to overcome and could overcome if they were willing to make different choices in terms of ideology and policy and style um, than they have been willing to make. But again, if you think you already sort of embody the what the public wants, you're not going to be inclined to do that. You're going to resent being told that you need to make any kinds of changes to what you've been doing. Um, both parties, I think, have, so that's what the, the parties have in common. On the Republican side, I think you have a kind of an odd situation where President Trump overthrew a previous Republican establishment and sort of exploded the old Republican program, which one could summarize as kind of free trade, entitlement reform, um, deregulation, uh, tax cuts. Um, he showed that it had limited purchase even with its own voters. But he didn't replace the old party orthodoxy with anything new um, because he, you know, he's just that fleshing out a policy agenda based on Im the impulse that he has that's not among his political talents um, or possibly interests. Um, now normally when you have a party that sort of doesn't know what it stands for, 
it's a party that's in the wilderness and is trying to figure out what it should do and what it should stand for um, while it's in the wilderness. But this happens to be a party that doesn't know what it stands for or what it wants, but also happens to have more power than it's had since the late 1920s and is in control of almost everything. Um, and this is why I think the congressional Republicans basically gave up after December of 2017. And, you know, that was it for major legislation. We've got unified control of the government. We're not really going to use it. Uh, and they're running for office right now, basically not talking about doing anything um, if they happen to win. And I think that's actually true. I mean, I actually don't think that they're going to do a whole lot beyond confirming judicial nominees um, for President Trump and, and continuing to not exercise any oversight of the administration. On the Democratic side, I think for 20 years now, really since, since the Clinton administration, the Democratic Party has been moving leftward. Um, both defeats and victories have been radicalizing experiences um, for Democrats, with the victories interpreted as evidence that the wind is at their backs and they're not going to pay any price for um, being too left wing, and um, defeats being sort of variously interpreted as kind of one-off defeats based on, like, you know, Hillary Clinton's unpopular or the Russians threw it or, or whatever, but not we were too left-wing or we were too left-wing on a certain set of issues and we need to, to change that. Uh, then, to the, the there's been just party sorting where the conservative Democrats of old became conservative Republicans and the liberal Republicans became liberal Democrats. And so these voters and politicians who used to exercise a restraining influence on their parties just aren't part of the coalition anymore. Um, and then public opinion moved left on some issues, which I think created a kind of false sense on the part of uh, Democrats that they, there's no such thing as, as going too far. And then finally, demographic change um, has been relied upon by a lot of Democrats for really, I'd say about 15 years at least. The, a lot of very smart, thoughtful Democrats have decided they are the coalition of the ascendant. Um, the demographic groups that um, conservatives uh, rely upon are shrinking as a portion of the American electorate. The white working class is shrinking. Um, the population is becoming less religious um, and less white. Uh, and this is going to sort of inevitably carry uh, a liberal coalition to victory. The problem with the coalition of the ascendant is that it hasn't gotten around to ascending just yet. Um, and I think there is a problem, you know, just like you know, they say that uh, uh, being right prematurely doesn't profit you in the stock market. Um, I think uh, similarly, um, courting the hypothetical voters of the future is not a good substitute for appealing to the actual voters of the current election. Uh, I think that did happen a little bit uh, in 2016. But I don't think that there's any fundamental thing that's going to cause either party, regardless of how this election goes, to to rethink the basic approach that they're taking. Um, it often has struck me that you know, with the Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, we had three back-to-back -back eight-year presidencies for the first time um, since, uh, since Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. And the tail end of that period was called the era of good feelings. So I propose that ours should be called the era of bad feelings. Um, and uh, I, I am afraid that uh, I don't see it uh, ending anytime soon, certainly not with the next elections. Thank you. All right, clearly you guys are not academics because you both stayed within your allotted time, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, a question, um, one of you mentioned, I can't remember um, which one, but the sort of 14 or thereabout percent of independents. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wh what do you do to reach them? What are the arguments yeah. you make to reach, reach those for your own respective? So within that 14%, 55% um, dislike both parties. So which is, you know, evidence that neither of these parties is actually all that popular, represents a majority of the country. Um, yeah, something similar in uh, uh, 2016, I think about a fifth of the electorate decided they hated both Trump and uh, Clinton. But they broke 47 to 31 for Trump over Clinton, and that's it. That's how he won. Um, that's, so I, the, the, what happened in that election was the primary attribute that voters were looking for in a candidate was can bring about needed change. 
and he was better at, at capturing that than she was. I don't know what that group is looking for right now, but that's the question, right? If they figure out that there's something that they want, like whether it's still we continue to need change, and they vote on that basis, that's the, that'll explain how they end up breaking. I mean, I think to go with negative partisanship, I think the Democrats' strongest play right now is just to keep pointing to the Republican Party, and especially its head, uh, the president, and say, bad guy, bad people, corrupt, mean, uh, nasty, cruel, not American, we can do better than that, we are better than that, and just bring that message. Uh, because those who are independents but might break for the Democrats are not likely to be the ones who are going to get very excited at the prospect of single-payer health care or uh, any of the other things on kind of the more left-leaning wish list uh, that I think you're going to hear a lot of in the Democratic primaries in about a year. Uh, so uh, I think in general their strongest their strongest play is to emphasize the badness of Trump, and he gives them material all the time. The problem is they have to do it and while not sounding unhinged themselves, because then the right then responds and says, yeah, but look, those, those crazy leftists are a bunch of lunatics. They're, you know, they're Antifa. They're going to attack you on the streets. They're going to accost you in a restaurant and scream in your, in your face. And so they basically, I would say, um, you know, be very, very critical of the Republicans, but uh, from, a, from a sort of tone of equanimity, uh, sort of like position yourself in how you say it as above that fray, uh, that would be the balance. And I'm seeing some of that, but then there are plenty there on social media and on other platforms, some on MSNBC and other places, you see plenty of the unhinged version of it too. So if I can get back in and get a second bite of the apple in response to, to what Damon said. If I could just play like democratic strategist, which is not a role that anybody would ever hire me for, um, I think that the anti-Trump message is maxed out, um, or at least as it has been made. If I were them, the aspect of Trump that I would go after is not outrageous, cruel, etc. It'd be plutocratic, mm -hmm. corrupt. That he says he's with you, working class folks, but he's actually with the people in the corporate suites, and you you go after him hard on economics. And you couple that with your own economic agenda that is not Medicare for all or single payer, but it's more like we're going to hike the minimum wage and so forth. I think that's the real weak point in the Republican coalition that the Democrats are not doing enough to exploit. Well, I included corruption in my list. But I mean, I, I, the reason why I emphasize some of the other stuff as well is both because Trump is always kind of leading with the nastiest stuff and because it, that more than the corruption argument, I think creates at least the potential for a more positive closing spin on the message, which is, uh, again, like, we're better than that, uh, we should be better than that, and then implicitly, I am better than that. As opposed to the corruption one, yeah, I mean, I, I am not corrupt. Uh, that's, that's a harder position to land uh, in a kind of campaign message. But I agree with you that the corruption aspect of it, the plutocratic aspect, is is important. It is it is hard to 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 make in kind of campaign sized bits and pieces because it involves intricacies and long, complicated investigations that often end up sort of un uh, you know not definitive enough at the moment. Like how do you prove in a campaign yeah. speech how corrupt Trump is with his hotels and his his, uh, you know, overseas uh, expansion plans for the Trump empire. That's sort of like eyes glaze over uh, a little bit difficult, uh, as opposed to, can you believe, you know, we America stands for something, inclusiveness. We, we're an ideal for all people around the world. We're not a, an armed camp with walls. You know, that that sounds to me more like a, a rousing positive message in the end, but I could be wrong. If uh, you're both right and we see uh, a change in the House but not in the Senate, do we see uh, an impeachment of, of someone, anyone? <laughs> well, they have to choose if it's Kavanaugh or Trump first. You know, on the... 
Why, why I mean, you... my view is, uh, I said this over our, we had dinner last mm -hmm. night talking about this uh, with some, some faculty here. I, I, uh, if they, if the Democrats don't, well, if they don't get the Senate with a margin of 67 votes, they're not going to remove Trump from office. So it would be, it would be preordained that it was a kind of pure gesture uh, it, of impotence, that they know they're going to impeach him, meaning they bring him up on charges, they have a trial, and then utterly fail to convict and remove him from office. And they have to, the Democrats have to make a calculation whether the political benefits of doing that outweigh the, you know, the, the political downside, which is that you look like a bunch of incompetent lunatics doing this, if you're not going to, I mean, what was, do you remember offhand, what was the final vote in the trial of Clinton in 98? 50-50. Okay. So, I mean, that didn't come very close either, and it didn't particularly help the Republicans at all. Um, at least I don't think it or did. 50-49 no really won because Specter voted not proven is under Scottish law. <laughs> If you recall, this is this is the kind of thing that made Arlen Specter my, my such a charming senator. senator. Here. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I mean, I like to think they won't do it, and that certainly, if you ask Chuck Schumer in confidence behind closed doors, do you think this is a good idea? He would say, "God, no. He doesn't want to do that." But as as with on the Republican side, the more rabid folks are in the House, and they've got a lot of activists and angry voters in their districts who want them to take this, this effort down. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of pressure for them to do it. I hope they don't do it. I, what about Kavanaugh, though? I, mean, uh, same... I don't see that going anywhere, uh, yeah. my view of it, at least. So on the Trump front, I think that they think they're going to be able to head off the pressure. The Democrats think they're going to head off the pressure to impeach, but they're wrong. Um, that by, you know, at some point in 2019, if they've got the House, um, a lot of liberals are going to be saying, well, we don't have a higher minimum wage or better health care or, you know, all these folks are still in the cabinet and you guys aren't doing the thing you guys can do, at least impeach him. Um, I also think that the politics of it might not be as fearsome as a lot of uh, Democratic strategists and the Democratic sort of leadership class thinks. I think, you know, the late 90s people... People are reacting to the impeachment experience against Clinton in the late 1990s, um, which was wildly unpopular. Republicans were very worried about it. But then let's take a step back. Was that really such a disaster for Republicans? They got the next, they got the presidency, you know, a year and a half later. And also, in the late 90s, the public was pretty happy with the direction of the country, was pretty happy with the state of American governance. And impeachment seemed like a disruption, a kind of threat to you know, an otherwise placid situation. That's manifestly not where we are today. I was joking last night, but I actually kind of mean it, that it is not at all impossible to me that the House votes to impeach Trump, and it's not even the biggest news story of the week, you know, the, the way things are going now. So, so I don't know if there would be such a huge backlash. There's already, there's already support in the polls in the 40s for impeaching Trump. Um, not a, you know, you don't have to build up that much, and if the economy were to turn south, that number would get higher. The really amazing thing is that, like, we've now gone one round each about the impeachment yeah. question, and no one has mentioned Robert Mueller. I mean, th that's yeah, the well, other yeah, right. wild card. Now, Mueller comes out with a definitive report that actually alleges criminal activity by the president that would get him indicted were he not the president. Then I think the Democrats might not be able to resist. They will have to. They will have such... I mean, that number will tick up quite a bit. Um, I actually hear, have you heard there's going to be some breaking story tomorrow about Mueller and rumors? <laughs> yeah, and then I've heard people say, no, it's just a hoax. Don't fall for this. Yeah, I, I know. Well, so, but you, you heard it here first. Unless it's a hoax, and then you didn't hear it. Maybe it has to do with Mueller's golf club membership, the, the great Trump conspiracy. Something theory. like that, yeah. All right. As you know, we have a tradition in the program. We always invite our undergraduate students to ask the first uh, question. So undergraduate student. Question. Yeah, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Johnny Soper. I'm a senior uh, studying political science. Uh, my question is uh, as both of you sort of predict that uh, the House will go to the Democrats, the Senate will stay Republican. Um, in 2008, when President Obama was elected, a group of House Republicans got together and said, 
we will do everything we can to stop every piece of legislation um, from being passed from this administration. And the polarization has only gotten worse since then between both parties. Um, if we have the next two years of a divided uh, Congress, does anything happen? Do we get anything done? Yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> no. No. Uh, I mean, no. So, um, I mean, even before the the current era of polarization, the last time we had a Republican Senate and a Democratic House or, or split uh, yeah, of that particular kind was eighty one to eighty seven, and that was already a period where you had more government shutdowns than you usually do. And I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that happen uh, again. Um, I just think there's not even a whole lot of appetite on the part of either party to do a ton of legislating. Um, and so, I mean, unless, you know, unless A, Trump would react to Democrats winning by deciding he wanted to make a deal with him, and Democrats were to say they're willing to do a deal with him, and both of those seem almost cosmically unlikely events, then no, nothing, no legislation is happening. Other things happen. There are judicial confirmations through a Republican Senate. And you know, cabinet appointees get replaced as they as they resign or or are indicted. And uh, uh, you know, one interesting thing though, we one thing we have not seen that maybe we see in 2021 is a new president with a Senate from the other party. Um, that hasn't happened since what 89 with uh, George H. W. Bush. And under this, you know, we used to have a tradition where everybody votes for the Secretary of State nominee, and that's now totally gone. Um, so does, under those circumstances, if that happens, how does the new administration staff itself? Yeah, the, I, I largely agree, although keep in mind also that um, increasingly the way government is running in Washington is that it's basically a game between the executive branch and the judicial branch. <laughs> And what you saw this morning with it announced that uh, Trump is apparently going to sign an executive order ending birthright citizenship. Now, that doesn't mean that that's going to happen because there are a lot of people, I would say the preponderance of, of experts think that that's the equivalent of him issuing an executive order to repeal the first section of the 14th Amendment, which obviously he cannot do. But he doesn't, or at least his advisors, do not actually intend it to mean that. What he wants it to be is a kind of laying down of a gauntlet that will lead a federal judge within about 10 seconds to say you can't do that, and then it work its way up to the Supreme Court, where there will be an argument about the meaning of the first section of the 14th Amendment and whether it, in fact, does confer automatic birthright citizenship on anyone born in this country. That's the courts and the executive branch doing the people's business as they understand it, and the Congress just standing there going, hmm. That is kind of what we, what we are seeing more and more of, and I think we're going to. And then there's also the dimension of, of regulation, the administrative state, where that's a, an ascendant issue on the court. Uh, and in the Trump administration, this whole idea of deconstructing the administrative state slowly, the, getting the courts slowly to undermine the decisions that have given so much leeway to administrative agencies to decide how to interpret law. If that starts being undermined, then you, actually there'll be a lot of very interesting and far-reaching stuff happening. But Congress won't necessarily have much of anything to do with it. So, you know, that's all kind of part of the ratcheting toward a kind of... Uh, a, a non-democratic uh, sort of, uh, I don't even know what to call, call that kind of government. It's kind of, you elect the president, and then the president appoints people, and the president appoints judges, and that group of people rule the country. And then you have Congress that kind of comes into town and leaves, and raises money, and occasionally passes a tax cut. That's yeah. yeah, so I think people used to, you know, was it Bismarck, who said that Turkey's was a weak power and its weakness was provocative. Institutionally, that's Congress. Its weakness is provocative, and it has led to executive and judicial overreach at its expense. And you know, the the I mean, the the, the, the idea in the Federalist Papers that congressmen will be jealous of their powers and uh, seek to protect them just didn't take account of the party system developing. Um, and so there's just there's not that interest in self-protection. The int one interesting thing that we could see 
is that the conservative ascendancy in the executive branch and the conservative ascendancy in the courts could, on some issues, be at odds with each other. So if the courts are serious about pulling back on executive branch um, discretion in interpreting various laws, uh, then that could clash with some of the things that, um, that Trump wants to do. So for example, one of the things that has been discussed uh, recently is the president deciding on his own to index the tax on capital gains to inflation, um, the idea that there's some wiggle room in the statutory language. The argument that he can do this relies entirely on the idea that agencies get to decide the scope of their own powers and courts shouldn't second guess them. If Gorsuch has its way and that's no longer good law, then that argument just completely falls to the side. And I think that's true of a number of other things that the executive branch might be tempted to try to do. Let's get another question. My name is Patrick Amini. Uh, I'm an undergraduate political science student. And not to pull you back into election predictions, but for people who are bullish on Democratic prospects in the House, there's sort of two competing takes. First, that Democrats are going to do well in districts that have voted for Obama and then Trump, because people with particular loyalty to Trump, that won't carry over to loyalty to a Republican. And then there's the argument that Democrats will do well in Romney Clinton districts because suburban women and other demographics that are uncomfortable with Trump will transfer that discomfort to the Republican Party. So my question is, do you think those two takes are at odds, and which do you think is more resonant, and what does that mean for the House in November? I mean, so it's possible, of course, to make some gains in both kinds of seats, and I suspect that that will happen. But I think that the Romney Clinton voters are the, and the Romney Clinton seats are better bets for the Democrats. I think the evidence from the special elections we've seen so far is that the Romney-Clinton voters after the 2016 election have been holding Trump against the Republican Party writ large and have been voting for Democrats, by and large, not certainly you know, uh, universally, but overall. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Ramesh that it, it can be both. I mean, those two things, I mean, my divide and conquer argument was sort of about that, that different candidates in different places can make different cases for themselves and tailor their message to the electorate in their district. So you could have both. But I agree that in general we've seen, um, we've seen actually more movement in the, uh, in the direction of, of Democrats in kind of Trump districts sort of becoming Trumpified even as Democrats, making more kind of hawkish statements about immigration, tougher statements on that. Uh, you know, talking about uh, the need for protectionism to save jobs, um, and just generally, the fact that those districts have tended to be more economically populist and culturally conservative actually can fit very well with a kind of Trumpist position. Actually, some of us, uh, like Ross Douthat and others, like uh, Ryan Salam, who who for years, uh, certain pundits on the center right have tried for a long time to kind of push the Republican Party in the direction of a kind of populist message. That's kind of more the message that they've thought the party should make for Republicans, that Trump sort of took over and took in a kind of much nastier direction. Uh, but, but you're now seeing some Democrats in those kinds of districts move in, in that direction themselves, which is interesting uh, and I think can in the short term benefit the Democrats, namely short term meaning next Tuesday. Uh, but once again, when we get to 2020, they're going to have a big yeah. problem. Yeah, so one thing that's and it's related to what I was saying earlier about the, the lack of interest in persuasion, I mean, it's really amazing to me. If you look at their counties in Wisconsin that voted for George W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump, that voted for Tammy Baldwin and Scott Walker, and I see next to no interest on the part of Democrats in bringing them back, trying to persuade them to come back. I see a lot more emotional energy in condemning them for having made their terrible vote. And um, that doesn't mean that they're going to lose in 2020, but if they keep that up, they're going to require external forces to get them across the finish line. That is like, you know, again, you have a bad enough economy that some of those voters just decide on their own to, uh, to come back to the Democratic Party. Um, but I just don't see 
the kind of effort from Democrats in trying to bring them back that you would think would be in the party's interest. Right, so instead of Hillary Clinton winning 67% of California, whoever is the nominee in 2020 will get like 75% right. of California right. and still get the same number of electoral votes. It, it does boggle the mind a little bit. I saw some, this is a piece in The Atlantic, like if the Democrats come up short in the House, they're going to be very interested in reforms to change the system because their popular vote wins should really be translating to more power. Like, how are they going to get these reforms through since they've just lost the House? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the paradox. I mean, step uh, one, lose. Well, step some of them are things. Some of them are things that they could do if they gained power. Other things are things that would require a constitutional amendment, which is like all the talk about the Senate. No, sure, let's change the Senate. A constitutional amendment. Wow, and buy in from a lot of states that benefit from the current arrangement. Well, of the Senate. Section That's the not gonna happen. Equal representation in the Senate is in the Constitution as an unamendable feature of the Constitution. Unless the state agrees. Unless the state agrees. Right, yeah. So if Wyoming decides, yes, we would like to commit political suicide, thank yes. you. Yeah. We'll just take one senator. Open that up to anyone. Wait, nobody told me that. <laughs> I take back a lot of the <laughs> Anyway, go on. No, on this very point, uh, um, and actually we, we discussed this over dinner last night as well, but uh, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, were we to see a, a, a blue ripple uh, or even a slight, slight red ripple, uh, in other words, uh, that uh, your predictions don't come true, in particular regarding the House and the Senate holds, uh, so that the, uh, the Republicans maintain majorities in both chambers. Uh, what, you know, s speculate, I guess, uh, what you think would be, um, you know, Damon suggested we might see a kind of extreme reaction. Uh, do we th yeah, in other words, we're beginning to see some arguments uh, following the Kavanaugh confirmation that the Supreme Court is illegitimate and its rulings will be illegitimate. Do we get into kind of a legitimation crisis uh, if, this, if that's the outcome of this election? Well, I, as I said last night, I think it depends on how it plays out. If, if the Democrats fail to win the House and they also fail to win the House because they fail to get a majority of the total votes cast, there will be anger and frustration, but I don't think it'll be a legitimation crisis. It'll be one of these cycles the Democrats go through periodically where they turn inward and attack each other for a year about what we did to screw this up. We gotta go left, no, right. And then Michael Avenatti will come to the rescue. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but if, if it turns out that Democrats win the total aggregate vote for the House by say four points and yet they come up short and are excluded, uh, then I think it's possible that you will start to see this, uh, you know, Antifa will no longer just be harassing drivers on the streets of Portland, but you could start to see terrorist violence uh, activity, uh, just a lot of anger and some of it turning violent. Now again, put this in context, especially for those of you who are, are younger than I. Um, in uh, in a 18 month period from 1971 to 1972, there were 2,000 terrorist bombings in this country by leftists. Um, compared to that, nothing is happening right now whatsoever. Don't believe what you see on Twitter and the Antifa videos and things. This is nothing compared to the early 70s. So there's a huge move from where we are to that. Well, do I think it's going to get that bad? I don't know. That's several steps beyond where we are now. But could we move several steps in that direction? I do think so. If you start to see evidence that actually a majority of Americans really hate this, what's happening in Washington, hate Trump, and yet at every step in the Senate, in the House, with judicial appointments, Democrats aren't getting any power, uh, people are going to start to get very, very frustrated and start rattling the bars, and that could mean violence, and I'm not happy about it, but I do think it's possible. <laughs> could happen. I see a lot of voter fatigue out there, and the ads are so negative that I'm convinced both sides are liars. Um, this independent group, we're so dependent on casting the results of the election, what are the chances they stay home altogether and don't show up at the polls? Well, a lot of them will, I mean, right? I mean, turnout in midterm elections is low, and that's why 
you know, you got to raise the decibel level on some of the uh, ads in order to convince people to vote. Um, and I think also it's true that uh, the grievance and dissatisfaction are what tend to motivate people in, uh, in these sort of more discretionary elections. Um, and that helps explain, one, why the ads are the way they are, but two, um, why the party in power typically loses ground in the midterm elections because their side is just, you know, as Damon was suggesting at the beginning, um, by nature is just more complacent and satisfied. And, the, and it is also, you know, you know why the, the congressional Republican plan of telling everybody that they should come out and vote because they're grateful for the strong economy and the tax cut uh, was, was doomed to failure because that's not the kind of message that actually moves people to vote in uh, a midterm election. The Democrats are after everything you hold dear, and there's a caravan that wants to move into your house. That's the kind of thing that'll get people to, to show up and vote. And they're bringing leprosy, said, fo said Fox News last night. Are you night. for leprosy, Dan? Yeah, Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Don't make me answer that question. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, when we think about the identity of the Republican Party, is the, is, are the Republican Party and the Trump administration, are they still distinct entities? And if there is a Republican Party that, um, it more towards what I think about when I think about what the Republican Party stands for or is supposed to stand for, um, what is their strategy looking into 2020 and potentially 2024? <laughs> So uh, they are distinct entities, although the distinction is getting blurrier all the time. Um, if tr you know, I think you know the Republican Party is invested in him right now and through 2020. I find it very hard to imagine a successful primary challenge to him. If Trump were to lose in 2020, um, what's the the line from Mad Men? You'll be you'll be amazed at how 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 much this never happened, right? Yeah. Like everybody will move on very rapidly from Donald Trump at that point on the Republican side. It'll be, you know, there'll be a faction of the party, but it won't be, have the kind of dominance, it won't command the party loyalty um, the way it does now. I think, so the, to, 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 to vastly simplify, um, I think there are basically three groups in the Democratic Party. There's sort of business-oriented moder moderates. Republican, you mean? Sorry, the Republican Party, yeah. Uh, business-oriented, this is such a disorienting time. Um, business-oriented <laughs> moderates, um, Tea Party conservatives, sort of full spectrum conservatives, and then uh, and it's this last group has become a more important group and and has only recently been getting definition, but I would call it um, white working class nationalists, for lack of a better term. Um, none of those factions is strong enough to prevail on all issues within the Republican Party. You generally need two of the three, uh, and you just. You know, any Republican Party, whether led by Trump or some successor to Trump, is going to have to manage that coalition. I actually, I mean, the one part of your initial remarks that I sort of disagreed with was the point along these lines about how, well, the Republican Party is not fully Trumpified. It's sort of going along with it. He hasn't. <clears throat> he hasn't really remade the party in his image. I actually, I, I think that might be true among kind of policy intellectuals. Mm -hmm. uh, but from what I can see in Congress and the Senate and just around the country, those who are against Trump are gone or leaving. They've died like John McCain or they're leaving like Jeff Flake. Uh, they're being driven out of the party. And they're being replaced by people who I think I, I do think that there's a, a kind of a light bulb has gone off that like, wow, he's tapped into something that shows that a different mix of things actually can be successful. And it is, you know, if, again, people like uh, the, the Douthat and, and Salam mm -hmm. argument who wanted to sort of make the Republican Party a little bit more populist for a long time, didn't see it unfolding like this, but it's it's this sort of in, intellectually incoherent combination of tons of tax cuts, like always, cuts to regulation, like always, but with an added edge with the anti-administrative state stuff thrown in there that's added sophistication at the level of law to try to show that a lot of the stuff doesn't have to just be rolled back but might be constitutionally illegitimate maybe, and then add in protectionism, 
uh, which is kind of couched in terms of protecting jobs to get that third group in the, uh, you know, motivated to vote, combined with very stringently anti-immigration uh, position. And you put that together, and again, does that make coherent populist sense? I, I, I would say it doesn't really, but the old Republican coalition didn't make strict intellectual sense. It just sort of worked as a coalition to get elected. And um, the number of Republicans kind of in the field, out in the country, who have adopted that combined with Trump's unifying bow on top, which is just kind of total rhetorical nastiness. Mm -hmm. No conciliation to the other side whatsoever, just attack, attack, attack all the time. Po go right up to the edge of like outrightly racist mm -hmm. statements and then put your toe over and then have plausible deniability, bar barely. Like that mix seems to have really caught on. And I, even if Trump doesn't win in 2020, I really can't imagine the party not going on to try to say, all right, we don't have Trump anymore, but we need something so, Trump-like to go forward. And you yeah, mentioned well, last night Tom Cotton is one person who's yeah, really trying to do Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think the Republican that. Party can or should revert to a sort of pre-Trump uh, definition of itself. But And, I, and I, don't even, I don't deny a lot of what you're saying. I just think it's possible to exaggerate it. So think about the top two legislative initiatives of the Republican Congress, a tax cut and a health care bill, neither of which would have had a single comma in a different place under President Rubio or President mm -hmm. Jeb Bush. If, if Trump has a signature issue, it's immigration. In February, the Senate voted on the kind of immigration bill that he wanted, and 14 Republicans said no, defected. It got, what, 39, 40 votes. And not only that, nobody who voted against him has faced any consequence from voters or from Trump himself, for that matter, not even negative tweets, for doing it. So I, I just think the, 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 the problem with the idea of Trump sort of remaking the party is that Trump isn't interested in doing the work it would take to remake the Republican Party. The party has changed Trump more than he's changed the party. If you compare how he's governed to how he campaigned on health care, on taxes, uh, you know, on immigration even, in, to some respect, it's the party's not, the party's moved him over. He can say whatever he wants, right? He can meet with Dianne Feinstein and say, yeah, I'm for a ban on assault weapons. His own people will walk him back, and the, everybody on, the, on Capitol Hill on the Republican side will just brush him off because nothing he says matters. If, if in anyone uh, posed a serious primary challenge to Trump, or if anyone could, who could it be? I, I just think Republicans might be pre prepared to abandon him if he looks like a sure loser, but the bar for looking like a sure <coughs> loser is much higher than it was because he came back from the dead in 2016. So I just, I just think it's going to be very hard. And then there's the fact that so much of the opposition to Trump, and so much of the sort of the Never Trump group, has a primarily character-based criticism of him. I think you know, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think the, the worst thing about him is his character. But it means that anti-Trump conservatives, some of them are for gun control. Some of them are against gun control. There, there's not a whole lot of programmatic agreement where, you know, is this a challenge from the moderate right? Is this a challenge from, from true conservatives who say Trump isn't a conservative, isn't conservative enough? You've got a small group of anti-Trump folks. They're divided internally. That is not the recipe for a successful primary challenge. Oh, yeah, I pretty much agree with that entirely. I mean, the problem is that he's enough of a, at least as he's governed, He's enough of a regular Republican that there's not a lot of space to get any kind of policy, uh, any kind of policy traction to oppose him, except for immigration and trade. So you could imagine someone trying to say, "I'm going to oppose Trump because we should be for free trade and we should be for a very not open borders, but very open liberal position on immigration." Could you imagine? Someone actually attempting that? Like, I love the tax cuts. I love the cuts to the administrative state and regulation of this president. But I hate the protectionism, and the, that's not going to And, and the effect of it would be to drive loyal Republican voters further into the protectionist and anti-immigration. Yeah, it's just not, that, that isn't going to, to do it. Can we get a celebrity candidate on the left? Uh, George Clooney and Oprah. Avenetti? No. <laughs> a real celebrity. A real celebrity. 
I don't know. Uh, maybe. I mean, that might be the future of American democracy, for all we know, is that basically you just have a movie star against a reality star against a TV star against a, a musician, Kanye. I mean, it, it's just, it is possible, and I dread that future, but with Trump, we already have the beginning of it. Go back to Reagan. I mean, he was a B-movie actor. People at the time were like, he can't be president, and then he was. Now Trump. There were some intervening steps. Yeah, well, it is, it, it is um, I, I mean, but in retrospect, you can now look back and realize that, well, there's a way in which pop culture is the one thing that that reaches the most number of people in this country. And so the the transition from that world to politics is much narrower than we might have thought, m more so maybe than from a governor's mansion to the White House. Yeah. So the, nomina the nomination and the, the victories of Obama and then Trump and then the weakening of the party structures, all of that has made it harder to call the field of presidential candidates. And when you've got a field of 17 people or who knows, I mean, Congressman John Delaney of Maryland, who probably, you know, three of you could recognize that name, is running for president on the Democratic side, right? So there's going to be 24 people running. Under those circumstances, a celebrity starts out with this huge advantage that they can get, you know, all this attention and people already know who that person is. And, you know, and in the case of Donald Trump, as we, we found out in 2015, CNN will cover you like you're a missing plane. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, could you? Yeah. Question over here. Toby, I'm in the corner, John Snyder. You, I don't need a mic. You, we need it. You, we, we need it. Sure you do. Three or four times now. I'd like to pose. Take the mic anyway. I'd like to pose pose a scenario to you. Um, Lindsey Graham has been uh, more of a, a what I call pro-immigration, or to come to some sort of model legislation. If he could convince Trump to come to some sort of middle of the road. Uh, immigration plan that was acceptable in the Senate, do you think a Democratic House would vote for it? Or do you think they would vote against it just to deny the Republicans and Trump, quote, a victory on a major uh, internal issue? Um, so uh, big if to start with. Um, my sense of it is that the Democratic Party, voters and politicians, have been moving left on immigration uh, pretty dramatically over the last decade um, and are, are just not eager to agree to even the compromises that, that Democrats agreed to in 2006, 2007, and 2013 on that issue. I mean, I think that's the issue. Then add on the further bridge of working with President Trump, um, I, I think that's... I think that's pretty hard. I also think that this whole idea of having one big piece of legislation that settles immigration is a mistake, that it ought to be broken into pieces and you can make limited progress. So for example, do a deal where you legalize all the kids who came here as, as kids illegally, and at the same time you ramp up sanctions on people who hire illegal immigrants. Um, and then after you've shown that you can do something like that, then you start tackling some of the other issues. Yeah, I mean, a few things. First of all, I don't. I think Lindsey Graham has has decided to uh, exit the room uh, on most of his previous stances. I think I saw just this morning that he he talked to a reporter about this the whole um, birthright citizenship issue and said that he wants to to sponsor a bill to. Uh, he, he's he's been on that before. That's not a new stance. On his yeah, point. I know, but he, he but his whole the whole way he handled the Kavanaugh business, he's remaking himself as more Trumpist all the time. So I don't think he would necessarily be the one to broker that kind of a, a deal on that issue. Plus, he'll be Attorney General. So. Well, that too, perhaps, or or you know, as uh, Secretary. Nikki Haley State will have to broker or, the deal as yeah, Graham's replacement. The de Defense uh, Secretary or something. But um, I, I actually think uh, immigration, for the reasons Ramesh said, uh, are, is not the best place for that kind of cross-party deal. I think the most, if, if Trump wanted to really kind of make a mess of things, meaning like work with the Democrats in the House and try to, to govern in a different kind of way after the election, it would be middle class tax cut and infrastructure bill. If he went back to those seriously and said to the Democrats, 
let's pass a huge tax cut for middle America and do a huge infrastructure project to fix our roads and put America back to work for few people who can't get jobs when we have 3.7% unemployment. Uh, then I think that, I don't know if it would make it through the gauntlet of Capitol Hill, but it would certainly mess with the Democrats in a bad, bad way. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do. They, they would be a, a million cross purposes. A lot of Democrats were worried that, that he would lead that way in January right. of 2017. And it'll be worse now heading into the election in 2020. So if he were smarter than he is uh, and more and kind of shrewder and wanting to just kind of mess with them, that's what I would do uh, if I were him, uh, rather than immigration. Young politician, and we'll define young as younger than yourself, uh, that's caught your interest that we should know about, and a book or two that helped shape your thinking. Can you go first? <laughs> uh, you know, years ago, I had the, the privilege of introducing um, the late, great Justice Antonin Scalia at a talk, and at the end of the talk, he said, I will now take your questions. Notice I did not say I'll now answer your questions. I always thought that was great. Uh, that was a great little formula here as I continue to stall. Um, <laughs> so in, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of politicians, um, I think there's still some of them you know, just need a little more seasoning to, to see how they're doing. Um, Mike Gallagher, uh, Brian Mast, uh, in the house, I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, Gallagher's, uh, Gallagher's Wisconsin, and I don't, I don't even remember where Mass is from. Um, but you know, nobody's quite distinguishing themselves um, yet. I mean, I, I, I still have hope for for some. Um, I, I think Cory Gardner's got a very winning personality. I don't know if he may be just exactly about my age, but um, but I haven't seen him sort of do much um, except for except for marijuana-related legislation for the state of Colorado. Um, ben Sass has a lot of you know, he's a little just a tiny bit older than me. He says a lot of great things. Again, you know, the, but you know, what has he done as a legislator or you know as a committee member? I, I haven't seen uh, seen a whole lot from him in terms of books. Uh, I should I should plug uh, uh, my friend Yuval Levin's uh, book, The Fractured Republic, which I think is a, is a really uh, interesting and and I think sound diagnosis of uh, of where we are uh, as a country. Um, over to you. Um, I'm afraid I have no answer to the first question. There, I, I can't point to anyone. Um, part of that is a function of the fact that my writing and thinking about politics is not really focused on that level. Mm -hmm. I don't spend a lot of time focusing on individual politicians and paying attention to what they're saying. I, I sort of give a uh, uh, kind of political philosophic analysis of the whole. Um, so I notice politicians, but I don't, uh, I don't like, I don't, I can't point to like, oh, there's this congressman from Missouri who seems really promising mm -hmm. uh, for the Democrats. I just don't think in those terms, really. And frankly, of, of the, uh, uh, the dozen or two dozen people who will be running, um, I, none of them seem that incredibly great to me either. I actually, although she is a few clicks to my left, I've liked Elizabeth Warren, but now that the Cherokee stuff happened, I, I'm just not sure if she has much of a, of a future. I mean, that, that was like political malfeasance of a high order, the way she handled that, which really gives me pause about whether she even has much of a future at, at the national level. Um, so I, I, that, you know, I'm more demoralized now than ever. Because you know, what about books that help shape recent thinking or even foundational? Uh, foundational, I mean, I'm a, I'm a creature of, of a kind of uh, students of Leo Strauss. So Strauss's natural right in history probably has had more influence on me than any other uh, book written, say, in the last hundred years. And then through that lens, uh, probably Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Politics, uh, probably more than any others. Um, but I'm I'm the rare liberal who's sort of a Straussian, so uh, if you read Strauss, you'll probably end up a conservative. 
But I'm I'm a conservative on uh, kind of higher level cultural issues what too. What led you to the social liberalism? Um, I simply I I find the contemporary Republican Party, and I've felt this way since uh, since uh, I don't know around the time of the Iraq War. I found the Republican Party is demagogic. I, I think that it uh, it wants to win elections by sort of um, flattering uh, people who are not that informed or thoughtful about politics and playing to their prejudices. And I found that to be pretty um, uh, incompatible with what I see as healthy politics. So I'm at the level of ideas. I'm sort of more of a conservative. But I think that the contemporary political correlate of that in our politics is a kind of moderate democratic position. I think another person who would agree with that is someone like Bill Galston, who will be coming here in, a, in a, about a month. Uh, so for those of you in the room who found something compelling about that, he too was, uh, he, he was a Straussian in his youth and wrote a couple of books um, before he became a, a Clinton staffer uh, that were political philosophy and a kind of Straussian idiom. Uh, and has remained on the center left, and uh, I think he and I agree on most practical political policy issues. Uh, well, I guess just two, two things. One person, I don't know how old he is, but I, I kind of like Todd Young. You know, when he uh, was gearing up to run for the Senate, um, he met with me and he wanted to talk about some ideas he had on poverty policy, which, you know, don't help, you know, like don't help him win office. Uh, there's an earnestness to him that, uh, that I like and a thoughtfulness. Um, on the, uh, what you were saying about the parties, I think that's probably that's a fairly good diagnosis of the Republican Party. I think you'll find that it's not a terrible diagnosis of the Democratic Party as well. Over time, increasingly <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.